Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar entitled Understanding Single Audit Compliance Requirements. My name is John Usanio. I'm a partner in Citrin Cooperman's New York City office and practice leader for our not-for-profit industry group. I'd like to welcome all of you to today's webinar, and on behalf of Citrin Cooperman, extend our sincerest hopes and best wishes that you, your family, and friends are all staying healthy and safe in these times. Next slide, please. So the pandemic has brought about many challenges, obviously for, for all our personal and professional lives over the past year and continuing on. The inability to gather coupled with the lockdown restrictions has caused some significant financial issues to all industries and businesses. In an effort to help those impacted to remain sustainable throughout the pandemic, several legislative and governmental programs have been established. For example, after the passage of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act, the CARES Act as it's better known, um, small businesses, including nonprofit organizations, were able to apply for and received billions of dollars in new federal funding under its various programs. The program that received the most notoriety is the Paycheck Protection Program. Other programs though, however, such as the Provider Relief Fund, and the Educational Stabilization Fund have provided billions as well. In addition, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, the EIDL as the acronym goes, also provided billions of dollars to the SBA for funding to provide to small business owners and other nonprofits with low interest rate loans. With all of this new funding being awarded and loaned by the government, many recipients now find themselves requiring potentially for the first time a single audit. And as you may have wondered, the questions that arise now are what does the organization need to do in order to be, become compliant ready? Uh, what is the expectations that need to be conformed with? And what reporting requirements will be necessary to comply? So our agenda for today and our objective will be to establish an overall baseline as to what the single audit encompasses and dive into some of the newer aspects that have been brought about by COVID-19 as well as the new CARES Act funding. Next slide, please. To help guide us along these topics, I'm pleased to be joined by two of my colleagues from my not-for-profit practice group. First, we have Gina Pelicano, a director in our Providence office. She has approximately 10 years of experience providing audit tax and accounting services within the nonprofit industry. Her nonprofit client base includes social service organizations, trade associations, membership organizations, as well as uh, health and welfare organizations. Gina is a member of the AICPA and the Rhode Island uh, Society of CPAs, where she serves on its nonprofit committee as well. We're also joined by Amber Alban, also an audit director in our Providence office who has over eight years of experience serving clients in the nonprofit and healthcare industries, including social service, membership organizations, skilled nursing facilities, FQHCs and assisted living facilities, among others. She is also a member of the ASCPA and the MSCPA and serves within their nonprofit committee. Next slide, please. So some Zoom reminders on the slide here are listed. As a reminder, this webcast is being recorded for future playback. We do encourage you to ask your questions utilizing the Q&A feature within the toolbar settings. We will have some time dedicated for Q&A towards the end of the webcast, but we'll also try to respond to your questions as they're received in real time. This session is also eligible for CPE credit. However, participants must fully respond to the polling questions throughout the webinar. If you encounter any difficulties in answering the polling questions, please uh, enter the question and response in the chat feature as an alternative for documentation purposes. Next slide, please. And so with that, let's open up our first polling question, which is, will you require CPE for today's webinar? Yes or no? Take a minute to respond. Five more seconds. 
Okay. Great. Thank you for responding. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to our speakers now and over to Gina for an introduction into single audit. Thank you, John, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody, and happy April Fool's Day. Today, we're here to talk about federal compliance requirements, which is certainly no joke. So let's dive right in. Next slide, please. I'm sure most of the people on the call today have heard the terms single audit, A133, or uniform guidance. Some of you may have already been subject to a single audit, while others are just going through it to the um, first time due to receiving new COVID-related funding over the last year. So what is a single audit? A single audit is a compliance audit over federal awards for organizations that receive and spend over $750,000 in federal funding in a fiscal year. A single audit accompanies a financial statement audit and includes additional testing over internal controls, as well as testing of 12 aspects of possible compliance requirements. Now the audit requirements and responsibilities are governed by what's called the uniform guidance, which is an authoritative set of rules and requirements for federal awards. A single audit is due within 30 days of the financial statement audit or within nine months after year end. Next slide. So what is the purpose of a single audit? Well, to me, the purpose can be summarized in one word and that's accountability. A single audit helps to ensure that federal awards are being spent appropriately and that there's proper management over those funds. We've all seen headlines about government waste and abuse and about organizations that commit fraud. So one of the key points of a single audit is to ensure that these things don't happen. Once the single audit is complete, they're, subject, um, they're submitted to the Federal Audit Clearinghouse with the data collection form. And one thing that I really want to emphasize here is that the single audit package is published on the Federal Clearinghouse website, so anyone can go online and access this information, whether that be grantors, donors, or the general public. So it's very important that your organization is not only submitting the single audit when they're required to, but that you are staying in compliance. So when the general public is looking at your results, they're seeing your organization in a favorable light. Next slide, please. So a single audit culminates in two key reports. The first is a report on internal control over financial reporting and on compliance. This report indicates whether any internal control deficiencies were identified, and that could be either a control deficiency, a significant deficiency, or a material weakness, and whether any instances of non-compliance were identified during the performance of the single audit. The second report is a report that's specifically on compliance over major federal programs and on the schedule of expenditures of federal awards. And we will have a slide later on today where we talk about what that is. So in this report, an opinion is given on whether the organization complied in all material respects with the types of compliance requirements that could have a direct and material effect on its major federal programs. Next slide. And one thing we want everybody to be aware of today is that it is possible that your organization may only be required to have a program specific audit versus a full single audit. A program specific audit, as implied in the name, it does include similar reports and the same deadlines as a single audit, but it's really focused in on specific programs rather than the organization's federal, federal awards and financial statements as a whole. And one thing also that we want to point out is that R&D is carved out of program specific audits. Next slide. As mentioned earlier, a single audit includes testing of internal controls and compliance, and we will be covering both of those. So we'll start with the internal controls. I'm sure everyone on this call is familiar with internal controls, but just to recap, Internal controls are the policies and procedures surrounding an organization's financial reporting and compliance function. An appropriately designed system of internal controls seeks to ensure accurate and reliable financial reporting. It helps to ensure compliance with laws and regulations, and it can improve the effectiveness and efficiency of overall operations. Internal controls are not optional and they will be tested during the single audit. And we just wanted to also point out that there are five elements of internal controls, and those include your control environment, your risk assessment processes and procedures, control activities, 
information and communication, and finally, monitoring activities. Next slide, please. So as I'm sure everyone knows, throughout the normal course of business, it's important to have a strong system of internal controls in place. And those controls should be documented and verifiable. During the single audit process, the auditors will be looking at your written policies and procedures and will wanna speak with the accounting department and other individuals who perform procedures related to grant compliance. As part of the single audit testing, you will most likely be provided with a list of selected expenditure and payroll selections for which you'll be asked to provide supporting documentation. When the auditors are reviewing the support provided, not only will they be checking the amounts and allocations to the federal awards, but will also be looking for evidence that the control was actually performed. So to give you some examples of what that might look like, if for example, we select an expense for testing, we'll want to see the vendor invoice. So as we're looking at their, that vendor invoice, not only are we making sure that you recorded the right amount, you did your allocation to the grant correctly, but we also wanna see that somebody did review and approve that invoice. Other examples may include looking at timesheets to make sure that the supervisor signed off on them, or we may look at your monthly grant billings and we'll wanna see that you know, a program director or the executive director may have signed off to indicate that their review was performed. And the overall takeaway here is that we need to see that the control had actually been performed. And John, do you um, wanna add anything about remote controls, um, internal controls, as we're all kind of in this, still in this remote environment a year into the pandemic? Sure, uh, I, I think that's one of the areas that has also taken um, new, new light with all of this, is the ability to electronically sign off or electronically approve all of this. Um, what's important to understand is that the documentation that is built in and around there be verifiable and as you mentioned earlier and be documented. Changes in policies and procedures may have occurred with the pandemic uh, and the shift to a remote environment, but it's just as important now as before to make sure that the documentation is in place and that the authorization and separation and segregation of duties still exists amongst the, uh, the processes, especially when it involves uh, allocations of expenses, uh, for programmatic missions towards these, these uh, compliance requirements. Thank you, John. And that does bring us to our next polling question. The question is, an organization is not required to have internal controls in order to be in compliance with federal regulations. Is that true or false? Okay, and do we have the responses? Oh, okay, great. So most people got this one right. Um, an organization does need to have internal controls in order to be in compliance. Um, that is something that gets reported on as part of the single audit. So it's definitely important that those are in place. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Amber. Thanks, Gina. So moving on to other areas covered under uniform guidance, the regulations contain a section on administrative requirements that recipient organizations must follow. The requirements include some of the following as noted here on the slide. Um, first, an organization must have a written conflict of interest policy. The organization has to disclose in writing any potential conflict of interest to the federal awarding agency in accordance with the applicable federal awarding agency policies. The organization must also disclose all violations of federal criminal law, which include fraud, bribery, or gratuity violations. Also, as Gina just discussed, an organization must establish and maintain an effective system of internal controls and evaluate and monitor compliance over those controls. Next slide, please. The most important administrative requirement is that the organization must adhere to very strict procurement standards. There must be a written standards of conduct that cover conflicts of interest and governs the performance of employees engaged in the selection, award, and administration of contracts. 
There must be documented policies surrounding the procurement of goods and the organization must utilize one of five methods in procurement, which is sometimes referred to as the procurement qual that you see on the screen here. To go into this a little more detail, we'll start with micro purchases. Micro purchases include goods and services that do not exceed $3,000. This states that these purchases or, or this guidance states that these purchases may be awarded without soliciting competitive bids as long as the organization considers the price to be reasonable. The next one here is small purchases and the acquisition threshold is up to $150,000 and price or rate quotes must be obtained for an adequate number of qualified sources. Adequate number that they state in the guidance of course is not defined anywhere but it is recommended that an organization may want to establish a policy related to this type of purchase. Generally, we see around three to five quotes are obtained for small purchases. For sealed bids and competitive proposals, the threshold is over $150,000. For sealed bids, formal solicitation is required, and generally the fixed price contract is awarded to the lowest bidder. This is a preferred method for procuring construction contracts, for example. Competitive pro proposals are utilized when sealed bids are not appropriate. The RFP has to be publicized. Proposals must be solicited from an adequate number of qualified sources. There must be a written method for conducting an evaluation of the proposals received. And the contract is awarded to the firm that is most advantageous to the program. That includes price and other factors and is not necessarily based on the lowest price. Non-competitive proposals or sole source purchase guidance may be utilized when either the item is available from one source, the item is for public emergency, the federal award agency expressly authorizes the method, or after all other solicitation, uh, the competition is deemed inadequate. In each of these above methods, there must be documentation and support kept for the decision, especially those when non-competitive or sole source proposals are utilized. John, did you uh, have a question from the group you'd like to discuss? Actually, we did get a question that came in on whether the lowest bid must be accepted when you're doing uh, competitive bidding. And I guess I'd Love, love to hear your thoughts on that and, and how you would proceed with that. For a sealed bid, the solicitation is required and the fixed price contract award goes to the lowest bidder. But for the competitive proposals, there's a lot of factors that play into it. And the organization must set standards um, and a policy in place to then determine who the contract goes to. Great, thank you. Thank you for that, John. Uh, we could go to the next slide. <clears throat> so the next part of single audit and standards we'd like to go through is the indirect cost rates. In managing federal awards and in overall operations, organizations have indirect costs attributable to each program. The indirect cost rate helps cover these costs. There are a few options for the organization to choose from, which include either electing to utilize a 10% de minimis cost rate or negotiating an indirect cost rate with the federal agency. Key factors to keep in mind when deciding whether to utilize the 10% rate or negotiate a rate are to keep in mind that the indirect cost rate must be consistently utilized, meaning you can't have five different rates for different contracts, and this rate does need to be updated annually. It also can be very time consuming and therefore costly for smaller organizations to try and calculate the indirect rate for the program rather than just utilizing the 10% de minimis rate. As a note, if the 10% is elected, it can be used indefinitely. And just to further explain some indirect costs include all overhead and rent and things that are attributable to the program in an indirect way. Next slide, please. So now that you have some general background about internal controls, indirect cost rates, purchasing, and so on, where does that lead us? 
The next step is for the organization to build a listing of all expenditures of federal dollars by federal agency, by catalog of federal domestic assistance or otherwise known as CFDA number, and or by clusters of programs into a schedule that is then called the Schedule of Expenditures of Federal Awards or otherwise known as CIFA. So what's that gibberish that I just said in all those letters? Simply put, the CIFA is a listing of all federal funding expended by each federal grant. Each federal grant has its own CFDA number attached to it that specifies the testing requirements under that program. The absolute key to this schedule is that it's based on program expenditures and not on receipts of federal funding. So for an example, an organization can receive $1 million under a program, but only spend $500,000 in costs under that program during the year. The $500,000 is what would be reported on the CIFA, not the full 1 million. Also, grants that are expended and that are passed through the state or other organizations also need to be listed within the CIFA. If the organization itself passed any federal funds they received on the others, this needs to be reported as well. Finally, the CIFA needs to detail the accounting principles utilized along with the election of the indirect cost rate, whether the 10% de minimis rate is utilized or not. The CIFA is just a combination of all the funds of the organization utilized by CFDA number, and it must aggregate all federal amounts. Next slide, please. So once an organization compiles the CIFA and passes it along to the auditor, the auditor then evaluates what programs will be tested. As shown on this slide, there are various thresholds for determining the types of programs to test. An auditor will evaluate programs for risk and dollar thresholds, among other items, which will then determine the federal programs to test. Overall, the key note here I just want to point out is that an auditor will not be testing all federal dollars an organization received and expended. There will be various factors that we look at to determine the types of programs or the amount of programs we test for the year. Next slide, please. So how is testing done and what kind of governs the testing that is done? Each year, the Office of Management and Budget, or OMB for short, issues a compliance supplement. This supplement contains eight sections and contains guidance on compliance requirements for many federal programs. There are a few key areas to the compliance supplement that I'm going to highlight here. The first key area is part two, which is the matrix of compliance requirements. This matrix identifies the federal programs by CFDA number and which of the 12 compliance requirements are applicable for each program which I'll talk more about on the next slide. Part five includes information regarding clusters of programs. A cluster of programs is a group of federal programs that have similar compliance requirements. Although the programs are administered as separate programs, the cluster itself is treated as one program for the purposes of meeting single audit requirements. The types of clusters include research and development programs and student and financial assistance, among others. As these clusters have combined compliance requirements, this section is very important if you have federal programs that fall within those CFDA numbers. Part six goes into internal controls, uh, which Gina went over previously and I briefly mentioned. This section has some good examples and more details on overall control environments. Finally, part eight is appendices for various topics. This section includes changes to the 2020 compliance supplement as compared to previously issued compliance supplements and program specific audit guides that Gina mentioned earlier for certain programs that can be tested separately if you qualify for a program specific audit. Next slide, please. So the compliance requirements themselves, as I previously mentioned, there are 12 compliance requirements that could be applicable to each program as listed here on this slide. Generally, there are only six that need to be tested for a program 
and those six differ based on the nature of the program. I'll briefly go over these requirements, but if you go into the compliance supplement itself, you will see there's tremendous detail on each of these. First, for activities allowed or unallowed and allowable costs and cost principles, the specific requirements for each program are usually stated within the federal statutes, regulations, and terms and conditions of the grant of certain key items that could be allowable or unallowable. Overall, there's some federal regulations that need to be followed, and there's a very comprehensive chart included in the supplement itself that details out some allowable versus unallowable costs. Cash management relates to the time elapsing between the transfer of funds from the US Treasury or pass-through entity and disbursement by the organization for program-related costs. This really ensures that the cash is being utilized in a timely manner. Eligibility requirements are specific to each federal program and are usually found within the statutes, regulations, and or terms and conditions of the grant itself. Equipment and real property relates to tangible personal property having a life of more than one year and a per unit acquisition cost that equals or exceeds the lesser of the capitalization threshold as set by the organization or $5,000. Matching level of effort and earmarking relates to various requirements, first to provide contributions of a specified amount or percentage to match federal awards for matching, requirements for a specified level of service or expenditure, and requirement that may, be, may specify the minimum or maximum amount or percentage of the program's funding that may be utilized for specified activities. These requirements are specific to each federal program and again are found within the statutes, regulations, or terms and conditions of the grant itself. The period of performance relates to ensuring allowable costs are incurred during the period of performance of the grant itself. Procurement goes into detail and relates to all of the procurement items that I went over earlier, such as the micro purchases or uh, sole source bidding. Program income is gross income earned by a non-federal entity that is directly generated by a supported activity or earned as a result of the federal award during the period of performance. Reporting includes all reports that the federal program requires to be submitted, including such reports such as federal financial report or requests for ad advances. Subrecipient monitoring is applicable if the organization passes funds on to a subrecipient. And finally, special tests and provisions are really dependent on the grant and program itself and whether they are really applicable. So Amber, we received a question that came in regarding time and effort reporting and how that's evaluated. Would you be able to um, talk a little bit about that? Is that in reference to the time and effort reporting for the grant itself, John? Yes. So maybe I, I'm a little... Um, yeah, I, I think the question is focusing in here on how you record time and effort. And sometimes um, what we've seen are findings where uh, a person, for example, a CEO or CFO is splitting time between programs. Let's, let's say you have two programs that have been incurred. And so one is a federal program and one is not. The allocation of that individual's time and effort needs to be detailed and focused and actual. Uh, oftentimes what happens with contracts and budgets, especially when you apply for a federal grant is that they're um, based on a budgeted amount. And then on a um, month in and month out basis, as you expend the time on the program, detailed records identifying that mechanism of what was charged and what was not charged needs to be highlighted. So 
it's important to maintain good records over time and effort, but more importantly, that it's contemporaneous and that it is actual time that is spent, uh, spent for reimbursement. Um, I know I've seen uh, a lot of uh, findings that have related to this area because of based on budgeted amounts and just wanted to, to emphasize that actual is, is very important in the determination of, of these costs. So hopefully that answered the question, um, but Amber, if you want to proceed to the next slide. I'm going to turn it actually back over to Gina. Yes, thank you, Amber. So now that we've covered um, what a single audit is, what it encompasses, we did want to just cover some of the reports that are included at the end of the single audit. So one of those reports is the schedule of findings and question costs. This report is prepared by the auditors and it summarizes the results of the single audit, whether or not there were findings or question costs. It lists the major federal programs that were tested, and it must indicate whether there were material weaknesses and or significant deficiencies. So any audit findings, whether those relate to the financial statements or to compliance will be listed in this report. So to give you some examples of what those may look like, a financial statement finding could arise if the auditors have to make significant adjustments to the entity's books and records in order to get them to be in accordance with US GAAP, i.e. generally accepted accounting principles. A compliance finding, on the other hand, would be something that involves a specific program compliance requirement. So for example, if we had chosen the WIC program to be tested as one of our major federal programs, the WIC program requires certification of each recipient's income level. So that would be something that we would look at. If the auditee is not able to provide this certification for one or more recipients that we selected for testing, that would be considered a finding. And one thing I also wanna point out too is that it's very important to stay up to date with rules and regulations since they're always changing, especially in the last year with things being remote um, because of COVID-19. So in the case of WIC, the certification that I mentioned, it was previously required to be done in person. However, because of COVID-19, the in-person requirement was actually waived and it can now be done over the phone. So something like that wouldn't be considered a finding because it's allowed by the grantor. So it's important to have discussions with your auditors as you're going through this audit process because something that may have initially seemed like it could have been a finding may not be um, depending on new guidance that has come out. Next slide, please. Oh, and a question actually did just come in um, with regards to how long does a finding stay on the schedule? So that's a great question. So, and we will actually be touching upon that. So um, with the summary schedule of prior audit findings, so this would be the next re report that's included in the single audit report. So for an organization that may have had a finding in a prior year, the current year single audit does need to include this summary schedule of prior audit findings. This is another report that is prepared by the auditors and it needs to report the status of all findings that were noted in the prior year report. And if the auditee has taken corrective action, they can just list the finding and state that it has since been corrected. So findings will stay on the report for two years. So after two years, they'll, they'll drop off and they won't be included anymore. Next slide. So the corrective action plan is another um, report that the auditee is responsible for. So to the extent that there are findings in the single audit, it is up to the organization to respond to those findings and to indicate how the finding is going to be addressed. If there's a situation where the auditee doesn't agree with the finding, they can note that as well. Now, this corrective action plan, it is a good opportunity to, for management to essentially provide their, um, their thoughts on the finding and how they're going to remedy it in the future. And we did talk about earlier too, you know, the fact that the single audit report is public information. Anybody can go onto the Federal Audit Clearinghouse website and access it. So whatever management is putting in that report, not only is it going to be seen by the grantors, but it will be seen by the general public. So it is important to tailor your responses and to make sure that you are presenting your organization in the way that you want that you want it to be presented. Next slide. So what are the risks of non-compliance? Now that we've kind of taken this deep dive into what a single audit is, um, 
you know, what happens if an organization is not in compliance? What if they don't submit a single audit or what if they do submit one and it has findings? So failure to submit a single audit by the deadline or having a single audit with significant findings and deficiencies, there could be several negative consequences. The organization may actually have to pay back the grant funds. The grantor may suspend payments. They may terminate the contract or they may even cut funding um, from future programs. And again, as I mentioned, single audits, because they're public, all of these issues, if they're out there, your organization could be at risk for reputational harm or negative publicity. In some cases, it could even prompt an external agency to come in and do an audit of their own. And I do just want to say that having a finding here or there, it's not the end of the world. And you know, certainly not submitting a single audit is going to get you in more hot water than submitting one that has one finding. Even when we have good systems in place, sometimes documentation gets misplaced or there's you know, simple human error. It does happen. And as we talked about earlier, management does have the opportunity to respond in the corrective action plan. Um, so another thing that we kind of want to emphasize here is to leverage your resources. There are resources available online, whether that's through the AICPA's Government Audit Quality Center, the OMB website, or individual grantor agency websites. And there's also your advisors, your external accountants, your auditors. We are here to help. Um, although the, the term auditor, you know, typically has a negative connotation, we genuinely do want to help our clients and we want to help you to make sure that you're in compliance. It's never an adversarial relationship between, you know, the independent CPA firm and, and the client. We really do want to be helpful advisors to them. So if you have questions on any of these types of things, please consult with your auditors or other resources. And with that, I think we have a polling question. Okay. The preparation of the schedule of expenditures of federal awards, AKA the CIFA, the summary schedule of prior audit findings and the corrective action plan are management's responsibility. Is that true or false? In just a few more seconds. Okay, do we have the responses? Okay, so we've got a little bit of a mix here. 77% said true and 23% said false. So the correct answer is true. So although the auditors may help prepare the drafts of these reports, ultimately the responsibility does rest with management. So it is important that, you know, as the auditee that you do understand how to prepare a CIFA and how to prepare the summary schedule and corrective action plan um, to the extent that you have one, but definitely with the CIFA, the CIFA is certainly management's responsibility and that's, that's gonna be true for um, really for all organizations. And again, we are here to help, so we are able to help you, but the responsibility does lie with management. Next slide. Okay. So as we transition our presentation today from the single audit introduction to specific CARES Act funding, we did wanna provide you with a few updates. The first is that in December of 2020, the OMB released an addendum to the compliance supplement that had been previously released in August of 2020. And this addendum specifically addresses funding that was provided due to COVID. It includes new audit and reporting requirements and it, ad it addresses the presentation of certain items on the CIFA. So for example, donated um, PPE that gets excluded from the CIFA, whereas purchased PPP is included on the CIFA. And also any funding that gets received that's specifically for the purpose of COVID, that word COVID-19 does need to be included in the grant name on the CIFA. Next slide. So hot off the presses on March 19th, just a couple of weeks ago, the OMB has issued a six month extension on single audits for organizations that have fiscal year ends through June 30, 2020. What they do ask is that organizations document their reasons for needing the extension. And that can really be something as simple as a memo that you write up 
stating that, you know, due to COVID-19, your office staff is working remotely, and as such, more time is needed to gather documentation. It doesn't need to be anything extensive, just something to explain why you need um, an extension. And I think at this point, it's understandable that organizations still need extensions. So I don't, um, I don't foresee any issues with, you know, how that documentation is going to read. But one thing that we do want you to be aware of is that last year, the OMB initially offered a six month extension, and then they later changed it to three months. So don't celebrate too much as they could always change the rules again. And I think we have another polling question before we get into our next section. Okay, so just to get a sense of where everyone is on this call today, has your organization received any CARES Act funding? And we'll close the poll in just a couple seconds. And while we have, while we gather the last few responses, I did also just want to mention that HUD did give an extension as well as of March 30th. Okay, so it looks like most people on the call have received CARES funding, um, CARES Act funding, 66% said yes, 34% said no. Okay, great. So this segues nicely into our final section of today's program the compliance requirements specifically related to the CARES Act. So over the last year, there have been hundreds of new grant awards given to organization, organizations in the hopes of providing some relief from the devastating impacts of the pandemic. With that, of course, comes more compliance requirements. And so what we'd like to cover in this portion are some of the compliance requirements relative to the four programs that you see listed here, the PPP program, the Provider Relief Fund, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, and the Education Stabilization Fund. And there also is, um, when you do receive the slides later, if you click on that link down below, there is a list of all the other COVID-related programs. And this slide also, we just wanted to show you which programs of the, the four main ones are included on the CIFA and which ones are not. So as you can see here, the PPP program is not included on the CIFA, but the other three are. Next slide, please. So on the PPP program, um, although it's not included on the CIFA and it's not subject to single audit, the reason we did want to at least touch upon it today is because we get tons and tons of questions from our clients regarding the PPP loans. I think it's probably one of the hottest topics of the last year. So the main thing that we want to emphasize to you that you need to be careful of is this idea of double dipping. So expenditures that have been funded by the PPP loan cannot also be reimbursed by other government grants. That is specifically forbidden by government regulations. So we just want you to make sure that you're clearly documenting how your expenditures are being funded if you did in fact receive PPP funding. And so just a couple of best practices that you can use to help avoid commingling or double dipping. Um, First, we recommend that you account for the PPP loan as a separate grant. So you can do that by bifurcating your general ledger accounts to ensure that PPP funded expenses are accounted for separately, or you could just um, keep track of it in Excel spreadsheets outside of the accounting system. Of course, that always leaves room for a little bit of error. So it's not the preferred way of doing it, but it certainly is a way of doing it if you'd like. Another option is to deposit PPP funds in a separate bank account and keep track of the funds paid from that account. And especially now that we have round two of PPP funding, which um, the application period has been extended. So it originally was, the deadline was yesterday to apply for the PPP funds round two. More organizations have become eligible this round. Now I believe the extension, um, the application period goes through the end of May. So if you haven't applied for funds yet, there is still time to do so. And the um, requirements in terms of what's forgivable expenses and what's not, those are relatively similar as last time they did add some more um, categories of expenditures. But for the purposes of today, the biggest things that we wanna emphasize to you is no double dipping. All right, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Amber to walk us through a couple of other um, COVID um, funds. Thanks, Gina. We can go to the next slide. 
So the provider relief funding or PRF funds as may well be known were created through the CARES Act and were provided either under general distributions or targeted distributions. These distributions were aimed to provide healthcare providers financial assistance in responding to COVID-19. The payments themselves were intended to help providers prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus and were to be utilized for healthcare expenses and lost revenue. We go to the next slide. So there are some funny things along with the provider relief funds and how they're reported on the CIFA. I know you're all thinking earlier, well, Amber, you told us the CIFA was based on expenditures and not on receipts or income. That's the one caveat with these provider relief funds is that you include the lost revenue calculations as an expenditure for purposes of CIFA reporting. So for example, if you spent $500,000 of the provider relief funds on COVID-19 incremental expenses, and you also had lost revenue calculations between years of $250,000, you would report the total $750,000 of program expenditures related to this program on your CIFA. The other key here is when to report the provider relief funding on the CIFA. Depending on the organization, organization, organization's year end, it depends on when you report the expenditures. The chart on this slide tries to help explain that. For example, 1231-20 year ends would report their calendar year expenditures and lost revenues. Any year end before 1231 would not report anything until the next year. For any entities with year ends between January and June of 2021, the organization would report based on calendar year expenditures and lost revenue, even though it will not match your fiscal year. The government did this because what they are trying to do is match the reporting that will be required into HHS's portal, once that is open, to match this reporting as well. The 2020 Compliance Supplement currently governs year-ends 1231-20 and uh, the period January through June 2021, but doesn't go into further guidance for any periods after that. The next Compliance Supplement will further go into details surrounding that. Next slide, please. The Coronavirus Relief Fund is one of the other largest COVID-related programs. It's known as CRF for short. These funds were received by state agencies from the federal government and then passed on to recipient organizations. The CRF was designed to provide funds to address unforeseen financial needs and risk created from COVID. The funds were utilized to cover costs not originally in the governor's approved budgets and for expenditures related to COVID. These funds are required to be reported on an organization, organization CEPA as passed through from a state agency. And for the period of these funds, the expenses have to be incurred during the period that begins March 1st, 2020 and ends December 31st, 2021. Next slide, please. The last one that we wanted to highlight is the Economic Education Stabilization Fund, or ESF known for short. This fund was established to prevent, prepare for, and respond to COVID, including costs for significant changes in delivery of instruction, capital acquisitions, improvement to help stop the spread of COVID, and emergency aid for students. It's also important to note that the funds received under the two CFDAs listed on the screen here are not subject to audit this year. Next slide. All right, it looks like we have a few minutes left for questions. John, I'm not sure if you saw anything come through the chat. I've seen a couple, so uh, let, let's jump to the PRF uh, question that's come in about lost revenue and how mm -hmm. it's calculated. Would you be able to give us some more details on that? Sure, that's a great question. Um, there's really three options for an organization or a provider to calculate lost revenue. 
Um, the first option is to take the difference between calendar year 2020 patient revenue and calendar year 2019 patient revenue. Another option is to take a difference between the 2020 budget and 2020 actual revenue. The caveat with this is the budget needed to have been approved and established before March 27, 2020 to use that option. The third option is any other reasonable method, which this does not go into too much detail. It requires submitting a reasonable methodology to the federal government, and it does open the organization up for an increased likelihood of an audit by HRSA. Right. Thanks, Amber. I received a question on uh, fees related to the uh, audits of the single audit under and, and whether or not they're allowable as PPP programmatic costs. Uh, Gina, would you be able to give some information? And then another PPP question that is following up on that is there has been a second round of PPP, as we all know. Um, and what are some of those differences or can we highlight the differences between uh, the first tranche and the second that have occurred? Yeah, sure. So let's, um, let's kind of back up with this one and start with what are the differences between the first round and the second round of PPP? So the first round of PPP, the maximum loan that you could have gotten was $10 million. The second round, um, the maximum loan is, is $2 million. There were also some differences in terms of who was eligible and, and what types of organizations were eligible. So in PPP round one, um, entities that had less than 500 employees um, would be eligible, whereas in the second round, it's actually limited now to 300. Um, in both cases, the forgiveness period would span from between eight weeks to 24 weeks, and the borrower is actually able to choose um, that time frame. And also just um, going back to eligibility for a second. So for the first round of PPP funding, uh, 501c3 organizations, veterans organizations and tribal businesses were eligible. Now with PPP round two, they did add a new category 501c6. So um, like a chamber of commerce would fall under that. Um, they did exclude professional sports leagues and political entities. So that just kind of covers some of the differences between round one, round two, who's eligible. Um, when it comes to forgivable PPP expenditures, so under the original PPP loans, what you um, were able to get forgiven were payroll and medical benefits, and payroll included all forms of cash compensation paid to employees, such as tips, commissions, bonuses, hazard pay, um, with the caveat that you needed to cap salaries at $100,000 um, annually based on prorated based on the number of weeks in your forgiveness period. Um, rent for leases in place prior to 2-15-20, mortgage interest for mortgages that were also in place prior to that same date, and then utilities for services that began prior to that same date. So under PPP round two, um, the eligible um, expenditures would include the same as round one plus operational costs, and those include software, cloud computing, HR, and accounting. So to answer that question, um, we believe that audit fees would be included in that, um, but it doesn't specifically say. So it actually says covered operating expenditures includes payments of human resources, sales and billing functions, or accounting and tracking of supplies, inventory records, and expenses. So um, we think it may be applicable, but the guidance doesn't specifically say yes or no. So you kind of have to use your judgment on that. And just some of the other um, costs that were added to be um, forgivable included any property damage costs that may have resulted from public disturbances that took place during 2020 to the extent that they were not covered by insurance, costs to procure goods that were essential to operations, and then finally, personal protective equipment PPE for employees. So with these PPP loans, the guidance has been um, ever-changing. It comes out frequently, and we stay on top of it. So when, as we get more information, we will certainly, you know, put out um, different articles and things um, to the best of our knowledge. And I will just quickly add to that too. So the single audit costs themselves, while it's not explicitly stated, they are covered under PRF funding as an allowable cost, as it is an incremental cost that the organization is, uh, is having this year because they have funds that under the CARES Act that now require an audit that they wouldn't have normally had 
and therefore it does qualify as an incremental expense and therefore allowable under the provider relief funds um, as an expense to use uh, um, for those fundings. Amber, thanks, Gina. Uh, another question's come in on um, when single audit reports are due timeframe. I think we've covered this, but uh, if one of you can uh, just highlight the time periods for that. Yep, so the single audit reports are due either 30 days after the financial statements are issued, so the audit report on the basic financial statements, or within nine months of year end, whichever comes sooner. Great. And another question's come in on an entity that has not needed an audit in the past, um, potentially a review. What are the changes that are going to take effect now? Um, that's that's an issue we've seen not just in the not-for-profit sector, but in the for-profit uh, world where reviews are more common. And now with the programmatic um, funding that's come in from the government, uh, additional uh, additional reports or audits may be required. So I, I think this goes back to the question on programmatic audits. So uh, Gina. Would you be able to speak on that? I'm sorry, John, could you repeat the question? If you only needed a review in the past and mm -hmm. now have federal funds, yep. what are your options for reporting? Oh, so if you only needed a review in the past, but now you need it, um, you would potentially need a, a full audit along with the single audit as well. Um, depending on what type of grant you received, you may be able to um, just have a program specific audit, which I think we're kind of dealing with some of that with a lot of our skilled nursing facilities, but um, you may have to go from a review to a full audit. There really isn't a concept of having a single audit that only goes with a lesser um, a service such as a compilation or a review. Great. And then finally, uh, last question I have is seen, seen is on internal controls and whether or not they must be tested. Um, I think we've covered this as well, but uh, Gina, thoughts on that? Yes, so when we do our testing on the single audits, um, it's always a dual purpose test. So it's going to include a test of the controls and then a test of compliance with um, the actual requirements of the, the federal program. Yeah, I, I think that's an important uh, aspect. You know, as you look at the auditor's reports and you look at um, whether it's the, the yellow book report or whether it's the uniform guidance report, there is a section that highlights an assessment on internal controls. And, and as we mentioned earlier, the ability to demonstrate that uh, to the public, that you are utilizing the funds and have appropriate controls in place surrounding the administration of those funds is a key element uh, on the uniform guidance. So uh, that's a great question that's come in. At this point, I don't see any further questions that have come in. So I will um, thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we hope you found this content insightful and helpful as you progress through your single audits. Uh, please remember that this information has been provided for general purposes only and as we mentioned earlier, a thorough understanding of the ever-changing regulations and compliance is necessary uh, before embarking on any, any positions. And to reach out to your advisors as you, uh, as you progress. I also wanna thank our presenters for all their time and insight. Uh, again, we do encourage you to visit our website for additional content, thought leadership, and up-to-date news on things that are going on, not only with single audits, but nonprofits in general. I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Stay healthy and safe, everyone. Thank you.